please feel free to share this audiobook with friends and loved ones. The Art of Selfishness by David Seabury Fill your life with confidence and success. Forward. Ideas are magical. They lurk in the strangest places, and often the simplest of them can transform all life around them. Benjamin Franklin sent up a guide, a French painter, thought it might be nice if he could only capture on paper the picture MSI could see. Einstein had the curious notion that light somehow was bent as it traveled through space, and the lives of untold millions were each affected personally by these ideas as though Lomion had reached out and touched them directly. Sometimes an idea can catch you at a crucial moment in your own life and jolt you out of a tailspin. Such an idea is the unorthodox thesis of this unusual hook. It was first published in 1937. It ran through many editions, was listed as the top bestseller by the New York Times in November 1937, and remained in print in its original edition for 11 years. Subsequently it had a long life in some reprint editions. One of the first reviews appeared in the Massachusetts Springfield Union, November 10, 1937, and what the reviewer, A. Corydon White, had to say was at that time quite surprising and is now worth repeating. It may sound like sacrilege to say it, but this book could do more good in some homes than the Bible. It should be particularly valuable in those homes where there is in law, relative, or general matrimonial discord. From the thousands of cases which have passed through his hands as a practicing psychologist, Dr. Seabury has arrived at a theory of living which is at once sensible and logical. Why has this book stood the test of time so well and helped so many? Because most of us run scared and haven't the courage to say no to people or situations that nag us or destroy us. We have been taught to feel guilty when we refuse someone's request no matter how preposterous, so we carry the world on our backs and suffer the tortures of the misguided righteous. The art of selfishness gave us a defensive weapon. The essential rightness of this book was confirmed in 1955 when Anne Lindbergh's beloved gift from the sea became a spectacular international bestseller. That exquisitely written book showed women how to get along with others and how to deal with the problems and pressures in their own lives. It helped them to achieve an inner harmony in the face of an outer discord, and it taught them how to do all this without feeling any shame about making the hard decisions that were called for if one wanted to live a good life. But 18 years before that, Dr. Seabury had already put his finger on the basic problem of interpersonal relations and had pointed out the startling but necessary solutions. It was a matter of selfishness? But whose? The answer he gave stirred up quite a bit of excitement because it did not conform, but it helped a lot of people see a way out of their own terrible dilemmas. The original idea for this book was mine. I persuaded Dr. Seabury to write it because I felt it was a statement that needed desperately to be made, and that it would strike spark. Besides, I knew that Dr. Seabury had, from his vast private practice, the innumerable case histories that could elucidate the thesis and that he had the wisdom as well as the skill to make it appealing. Why then a revised edition now? Because the specific references to events of the thirties are no longer pertinent, in some cases, they are incomprehensible. The changes I have made are few, and all of them have been checked and approved by Mrs. Evelyn Seabury, who was Dr. Seabury's skillful collaborator during the creation of all his books. This book has done much good, but most of it quietly. Every now and then a reader would write to Dr. Seabury to thank him for the help the book had given but otherwise there has been silence. But in November of 1962 this silence was shattered. A famous Hollywood actress and television star who is now a great success, but prefers not to reveal her identity here, disclosed that she had stumbled over this book at what was, in her own words, a very low point in her life. She had found a battered, old copy of the book while rummaging through a second-hand bookshop something about the title intrigued her, probably because she had been brought up to believe otherwise, and the idea seemed shocking. What she found as she flipped through its pages changed the whole course of her life. 
This was the notion that saved her from emotional confusion and despair. Don't worry about the whole world, if you do it will overwhelm you. Worry about one wave at a time. Please yourself. Do something for you, and the rest will fall in line. The idea appealed to her. Everything she did from that moment on had to be measured by the one rule, is this good for me? If it was, no matter what others thought or said, she did it, if it was not, she just didn't. You can't imagine how calm and effective my life became as a result of applying this test, she explained. The art of selfishness helped me over one of the worst periods of my own life. I am sure it can do the same for anyone else who reads it carefully, and carries out, with firmness and conviction, the startling but practical ideas it has to offer. It will take courage to do it, because people will talk, especially those who have been riding on your back. But stay firm. Do what is good for you. Do this and you will discover, as I did, that what is good for you is invariably good for others. The word no, or the phrase I won't do it, is a wonderful weapon in the arsenal of life. Here, then, is a manual for dealing with the problems of selfishness. The selfishness of others. What they term selfishness is really their own, not yours. Once you learn that, you are on the way to an uncluttered and joyful life. Air and Sussman. Introduction. Challenge of the Hour. If there is any way to live without having to make such a fuss about it, most of us want to know what it is. Mystics may talk of rewards in the hereafter, savants discuss Latin derivatives and the fourth dimension. We who struggle in everyday life wish some remedy for trouble in the here and now. How close can we come to joy, how far away from pain? That is the question. It may be nobler to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune but it's not to our liking, and anyway those instruments of death are out of date. There ought to be something on the human side as efficient as machine guns to defend us against the horde of bothers that crowd us in office, home and street we've been oppressed too long. We'd like some way to overcome the odds of a greedy world. Are there any? None, according to pessimists. You must bear your burdens, cry the moralists. It's that kind of world, sophisticates maintain. I'm not convinced, however, that the intelligence which split the atom and is sending man into outer space is incapable of discovering ways to live more easily. If our social forms had changed as rapidly as our material structure, all might have been well. As it is, our mechanics belong to the present, our financial and social ethics to the past. We are culturally and politically a thousand years behind man's needs. We cannot go on in so top-heavy an environment. We must give up our mechanics or improve our conventions. I wonder how you meet your troubles. Do you get along with your relatives more comfortably than your ancestors did? Are the children simpler to handle? Is your job less tiring than skinning a bear? Are the taxes easier to pay than tribute money? People suggest we have become a soft nation because of civilized luxuries. I doubt it I don't believe we're civilized. We've made an objective structure of office buildings and subways for barbarians to push about in. We've fashioned a set of laws and a pseudo-morality that requires us to employ Ola, trying to deny ourselves as he did, when we don't feel like serfs of virtue. If we are savages at heart, we'll get nowhere walking around in angelic costumes, flapping our wings to cover our depredations. We'll go further with honesty and an ethics suitable to our caste. A serious factor in life nowadays is that many of our superstitions stand as directly in the way of our conquering troubles as they did centuries ago. What would you think of a man if he had himself stood on his head and let his eye be gouged out to cure the gout? That was a method in vogue at the time the customs were established that you have followed in handling your problems. Once upon a time, to propitiate the gods, men performed strange rites, and lived in terror of taboos. Today the god of opinion, what will people think? Works just as much mischief. In countries where flies were sacred, it was a sin to kill them. In consequence, germs spread everywhere. 
children lay writhing in fever from the ravages of disease. In America, many a problem is unsolvable because of similar taboos. You cannot deal with the germs of incompatibility or the pressure of predatory intimates. Sentimentality stands in the way. Once upon a time, in a supposed worship of God, society might have required you to sacrifice your children on the altar. Now, you must sacrifice them in the name of quasi-unselfishness, allowing some virulent influence to stay in your home, when you know their tender minds are injured. Fear of claiming your rights is today as insane a frenzy as ever ruled the heather. No juggernaut took greater toll. The next step in human progress is to dump the load of sanctified idiocy we miscall our moral values, and accept the principles of nature. Man has done this in mechanical and scientific realms. We don't believe in a river Styx and a special hell under Wall Street to which its gangsters go. Nor do we expect to fall off the edge of the earth. We've given up superstition in the physical area. But if you mention to a fear-ridden follower of the conventions the thought of discarding the sanctions of the Dark Ages, ideals of conduct that came into being when it was considered a sin to unravel the mysteries of life, you shock his sensibilities. He looks at you said eyed and shakes his head. This arrogant egotism is the worst trait in human beings. It kills all prophets who challenge its stupidities. It is willing to accept the foolishness that injured other generations. Its own conventions alone are right. This was once the attitude toward matters of science as well. It still dominates in economics and the law. Only as ignorance has given place to fact has trouble been overcome. No people has long endured which has not rid itself of antiquated ways. Plowing with a piece of wood, or crossing a river on a log, was useful in its day. Slavery had its merits. Incest, practiced for centuries, may at times have saved humanity. To worship a wooden god was better than irreligion. Shall we then maintain a custom because it has served? That is the attitude in the moral realm. Many otherwise intelligent people still deny the rights of self and quite as blatantly mistake the nature of trouble. They believe man's character is evil and as such should be suppressed. They treat misfortune as a punishment for wrongdoing, a discipline meted out by God upon a throne to his rebellious subjects. That germs exist is a misfortune. To have deserts to cross in order to reach verdant fields, forests to clear to raise grain, is trouble. No one made it so in order to punish us. Life is constituted on cosmic principles. Our difficulties lie in overcoming the raw realities of nature. Nor is this less true of equally primitive forces in human nature. The digging of soil and the cultivation of consciousness are the ends of effort, science and art. Every winged victory comes out of the ground. In this threatening period no conquest is possible if we do not use the same spirit in understanding the problems of man's thought that we have so nobly revealed in the control of material substance. We must use the self-same purpose that has harnessed the forces of nature if we would regenerate and direct the powers of man. Not otherwise will humanity avoid self-destruction. This means that we must master and obey two great principles applying them in everyday experience. The first I would call the basic law of being, the second the magic formula of human relations. You'll admit that to be content within yourself and to be at peace with your fellows are major aims in life. One can put the basic law into three words, never compromise yourself. No matter what the situation, how pressing the problem, never give up your integrity. When you do, you make more sorrow than when you don't, hurting everyone in the end. The magic formula is also a three-word principle, no ego satisfactions. Never exalt yourself and vent your emotions to inflate your mind or magnify your pride against life. To win, you must obey nature. Her will, not yours, is omnipotent. This is not a surrender to prejudice, nor a return to the values of antiquity. It is of science and with science. To be happy, we must discover what life is and how it operates. 
a continual uncovering of truth for subjective expansion is quite as essential as in mechanical action. Power is a matter of cosmic law, morality, when right, is in harmony with natural phenomena. To bring this conclusion from the level of speculation to the testing laboratory of daily experience, let us suppose that you are considering some vital step in your life, going to college, selecting a vocation, choosing a wife or trying to settle a strike. How would you have gone at your task in the old days? Was not learning in the Middle Ages an artificial matter, without much relation to reality? And as to your work, you selected a vocation after the pattern of your family, knight, page, artisan's apprentice or serf. Considerations of your abilities and constitution did not enter. A wife? She was the baggage. You married for a hundred external reasons, from family to fornication. If ennobled, it was arranged, when at the peasant level, it was enforced. Love had little to do with it. No one conciliated the mob or considered its will. One put opponents to the sword. This solution is still followed in certain lands. Nor is marriage as a matter of barter, or vocation by parental edict, extinct. Even our colleges smell of the mustiness of superstition. But change is upon us. The greatest transition man has ever seen is taking place. Knowledge is pushing tradition out. Character is measuring the fitness for work. Love is slowly becoming the reason for sex and parenthood. A glimmer of social justice a passing of the despots, is taking place. Should we not in our own lives make this mighty step, this crossing of the threshold from the darkness of ignorance to the enlightenment of a natural world? Should we not put obedience to cosmic law and bionomic principles, by which one means ways of life that are natural and discovered by scientific seeking, in place of the oblique prejudices that ruin our days? This decision each man must make for himself. Behind war and international questions is that of the integrity of peoples, the right to be themselves, unmolested and unenslaved. Within this and beyond it is a mightier question, the right of any class to live and work, unmolested and unenslaved. We are on the battlefield of this great issue. Nor is this struggle for the law of integrity, never compromise yourself as a person, as a class, as a people, the only world issue. Mutual aid and cooperation, those formative principles of human relations, those fulfillments of the magic formula, all these are equally at the front in our crisis. They contest the greed that has ruled trade and tradition until now. The right to live, the right to love, these are the battle cries. Shall we, in our personal lives, follow the old or the new ways? Shall we continue as slaves of decadent conventions, or take a place as self-respecting men upon earth? And as to the worship of avarice that brings such toil and trouble, shall we supplant it with mutual aid, establishing the art of cooperation in our homes, among our quindred and in our social practices, or keep the envies and fears that heretofore have shaped our destinies? Those are the questions, as challenging for you and most for a troubled world. 1. The pressures of living. You know how man feels when troubles crowd and press, when after a day of routine he looks at life with harsh awareness. The monotony of effort is overpowering. It was late July and sticky hot. The edge of the wall cut the river in two. Dull red bricks, seamed and sooty, formed part of Haldeva's view. On the left, sunlight flickered on the water and shone on distant hills. To the right, gloom and grime. His life was like that, Hal thought, except that the flatness of civilization was more than half of it. A little of his vision had some of nature left, a few trees and a lilt of sky, but the rest, monotony and cement. It wasn't the desolation of duty that appalled. He could bear his work, dull as it was. Never to be free of pressure, to carry his family on his back, was another matter. He'd been doing it for years, so patiently that each month added to his burden. If Nelly, his daughter, quarreled with her mother, she would wait for him at the front door ready to engage his allegiance against her maternal foe. 
If Jack had difficulty in school, his father must do to him. Hal's brother drove down to the office to be first for his services. His mother, however, asserted a prior claim. Hal was bone of her bone and, come what may, should live for her. He straightened his tie and closed his desk. Well, time to go, no use looking at that view. His family would have to wait tonight, hours more of business to finish. He grabbed up his papers, a sausage advertisement, one for patent medicine, the layout for a toilet soap and his cigarette account. The stuff he'd attended to for years. Ashamed of tears in his eyes, Hal hurried to the elevator. Ever since he was a boy, something had been wrong with his life. No matter how he tried, he couldn't get out of strain. He did what he could for people, but they weren't satisfied. He was their drudge, never an equal, seldom a friend. Hal, as a boy, had dreamed of being an artist, of painting the limitless sky and the meditating trees. He toiled to tint his brush with the haunting pigments of beauty. In his brain moved a dynamic symmetry. He saw his canvases as messages to lure men from the drabness of their ways. Years passed, a girl had smiled, a ceremony was said. The painter disappeared in the businessman peddling his amputated art to pay for rent, dishes, onions, new hats, the needs of each approaching baby. He toiled under pressure, worrying about the situation, in conflict over a thousand encroachments on his life. His thought, once direct and clear, was circular and crooked. Sometimes he lay in bed, his brain in a whirl, thinking of the problems he couldn't meet his relation to himself, his career, his marriage, everything was caught in the mesh of involvement. Yet these were not the worries that seared his soul. A morbid, moribund anguish locked his brain and torpor. He raged that life should be spent in this senseless way. At eighty he'd find himself carrying the same load. Creative natures act not alone in such brooding. Life does not select idealists as her only victims, though society likes to destroy them. Nor is the struggle masculine. Fate enslaves her own sex, even when a man is the economic root to which it clings. Women know their gamut of weariness. The problem of keeping a male as security is not all of it. There come periods in which the bonds of intimacy yield small dividends, while the expense of spiritual upkeep is great. It was like this with Hell's wife. Meg had to be hydra-headed and many-handed. Enough to spend each penny with the skill of a Shylock, do a million details about the house, yet nurse her husband and babies as well. Her troubles were those of five ordinary persons in a less dizzy world. It seldom occurred to Hal that Meg bore a burden greater than his own. Did he not earn her livelihood? Was she not in the home, protected and free to use her life as she chose? Only those who are placed in a position to know from contact with both sides of such a situation ever gain a line of perspective. Suppose Hal had been so intimate with you that he felt impelled to tell his story? Would he have painted a great picture of his wife's pressure? or spoken only of his own. Let us imagine that she was your friend, and in one of those times when her mood was close, she described her endless dilemmas. Would you have guessed how Hal struggled? Each would, have given the feeling of being misunderstood. Too much was required of Thorn. Neither had freedom. A little bridge, a dance, the theatre, that was all. Communication was rare between them responsibility kept them under. With the feeling of slavery to work, Hal would have told you of his wife's extravagance and the snobbishness of her family, how she permitted insubordination in the children, yet dominated him herself. She never let him alone, yet he couldn't stand her neglect after one of their quarrels. He was sure she no longer loved him. There wasn't much use keeping on. Meg would have spoken of being overworked bothered by inconveniences and by living in a neighborhood she couldn't stand. She had a feeling of futility. Her faith in people, life and religion was gone. Is this an exaggerated picture? You know it is not. You can duplicate it in your neighborhood, among your friends and maybe in your home. It is American life, at least a goodly part of it, 
not as it appears to sentimentalists, not as casual observers know it, but as those who touch the core of things have found it to be. And the cause? Fear? Fear of selfishness? Fear of being and doing as nature does? Fear of living according to one's kind? Compromise of self, of love, of life? Cynicism is a pressing question. What shall we do with our doubt? How shall we avoid futility, that dry rot creeping up the spine of youth? If Hal felt much of his effort was useless, Meg realized the sacrifices they had made were wasted. Hal's brother was no more adjusted, despite all that had been done for him, Nellie no stronger or finer because of their sacrifice. Nor had she, Meg, by enduring the jealousy of Hal's mother, done anything but suffer. The foundations on which these two depended were falling into dust. Failure of life on the pattern we have worshipped, despair in the face of a false ethic, these are spreading unhappiness in every home. The burden of duty on the basis of unselfishness is destroying the world. It makes people, accept the presence of a relative they can't in the end endure. Live in a neighborhood that offends their beings. Take a job that goes against the grain. Marry a person they no longer love from fear of causing hurt. Maintain a relationship they cannot bear because to get out of it seems ruthless. Accept a responsibility that constricts usefulness and compromises the future. Work beyond their strength to support someone in luxury. Take people on as a burden, who could take care of themselves. Deny the expansion of personal, gifts because their development seems impractical. Let intimates snag or dominate in order to keep the peace. Do things against the feeling of integrity because someone thinks they should. Deny basic needs to obey archaic conventions. In the end, if we yield to such timidity, we make more sorrow than if we follow our own desires. Fear of self is the greatest of all terrors, the deepest of all dreads, the commonest of all mistakes. From it grows failure. Because of it, life is a mockery. Out of it comes despair. There is no fact, no interest, no concern more important to your happiness than this. To break from the jail of circumstance, you must take your courage in hand. But let us understand each other. This new liberty is not anarchy. There is no counseling of greed, of lust, of licentiousness in the attitudes of science. We are not justifying the frenzies of our age. Nor do we defend the barbaric ruthlessness so apparent in young people these days, that careless selfishness that die flowers in your garden, runs your car into a ditch, mocks you for your sentiments and derides your faith in God. The rampant egotism of our day is not the product of a better ethic. It comes from the absence of any controls. Youth has rebelled against the shrunken values of its elders. It is too often footloose, sex mad and crassly indifferent. Riotous arrogance and rupacious rebellion are not constructive selfishness, they are insanity. 2. The key to your problems. Each of us, through some part of his life, is pursued by trouble. No matter what wealth or position is ours, fatigue inevitably appears. Details of home and business, the greed of relatives and the mischief of children, all these cause strain. None of us escapes. Are such bothers avoidable? Can life be made an easier experience? Or are there troubles attendant upon the very act of living, part, shall we say, of the play and interplay of normal independence? I wish to do this, you to do that. Our purposes at times collide. We do not want to hurt each other, but wish still more to act as we choose. As difficulty is part of nature, so inconvenience may spring from the very fact of individual desire. For years I have asked a question that bears on this point. A young boy, traveling with his parents, was separated from them and did not communicate for days. They searched for him anxiously. When discovered, he paid little attention to the sorrow his absence had caused. Was this conduct selfish or unselfish? If he'd been my boy, I'd have shown him, many have answered. When I suggest that my friends read how Jesus in his youth lingered with the wise men in the temple, they are less vocal. 
Sometimes I've told another story of an unmarried man who, forsaking his trade, left home without saying where he was going. When his mother and her family went looking for him, he spoke questioningly of their right to do so. Was his conduct selfish? Who is my mother, and who are my brethren? Is a potent query. This man became involved with the authorities. They considered his activities revolutionary. An arrest led to his death. He did not at any time limit his conduct out of consideration for his relatives. People are told to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, to shape their behavior upon his. Ethical leaders hold before to followers his consecration to duty as he saw it. I have yet to find those who consider the whole picture. His relation to his family is ignored. The reason for this neglect is not hard to understand. No one could follow him and fulfill our moral code. The two are incompatible. Someday, in an urge to conquer trouble, we shall learn the part unselfishness plays in hindering us, unselfishness as advocated in our time. We shall see its relation to the flood of mental breakdowns, trace its influence in divorce. We shall know how it drives men to crime, and find it a cause of suicide. At their worst, greed and envy have not wrought such havoc as rejection. The successful handling of everyday problems is difficult until we understand this enigma and how wisely to direct ourselves in the situations we meet. The key to most difficulties does not lie in the dilemmas themselves, but in our relation to them. It is moreover, our wits we must think with, our bodies we must use to produce good results. Neglect of ourselves as persons leads to ineffectuality. More than this, many acts of apparent unselfishness, when viewed in terms of the ultimate outcome, prove to bring sorrow to those for whom the sacrifice was made. Good and evil are not matters of a moment. Wisdom and foolishness are measured by the developments of years. Conduct is wise or foolish only in reference to its results. Neither selfishness nor unselfishness, when truly applied, has to do with your relation to another person. They pertain to life. When understood, both are good and beautiful. If you do not concern yourself with being a vital force, you cannot serve the world in which you live. You become a burden. Constructive self preservation is man's first duty. Without it, life makes parasites of us. Everything that leaves, from the moment it comes into being, seeks its nourishment and continues so to seek. The food of a man is emotional and mental as well as, physical. He who does not ask, even demand, his right to special nourishment sickens and becomes a burden by the measure in which he denies his birthright. There is no wise unselfishness without basic self-concern, no permanent power for goodness if the organism which fulfills that goodness is limited or injured. Your duty is to yourself. It is provable that a true ethical structure and every vitality of religion builds on this forthright doctrine. Dr. Pierre Janet has said that no man is normal who does not love his psyche. He cannot otherwise keep himself in order as a useful citizen. Nor is this true of humanity alone. It is a cosmic principle. The worth of a cabbage depends upon the way it fulfills a promise in the seed. The value of a cow hears in her health and development the service of each creature lies in this selfishness. When denial constricts this duty of an organism to be itself, it is against life and as such becomes evil. The surrender of the least of one's primary rights leads to some measure of corruption before the span of is over. The duty to others is achieved only by being what one can become as radiantly as possible. This is why Dr. Jenny counseled the self-love that protects and develops one's attributes. Such a higher selfishness is identical with religious reverence, but hatred of one's self is tantamount to blaming the Creator for one's nature. Condemnation of self and condemnation of God are one and the same. Gratitude for the qualities of self and acceptance of the responsibility of life are simple forms of worship. Consideration of this principle is essential to the understanding of difficulties. It is the key to our problems. We cannot otherwise avoid the influence of the antiquated ideas about us. 
people do not know that when unselfishness is true it is not a sacrifice but a proper use of self in obedience to cosmic laws. He is unselfish who yields to universal principles and willingly obeys their laws, scientifically discovered and repetitively proved. He is greedy who takes from society store than he gives to it, living cm an income he miscalls his own. He is truly unselfish if day by day he does those things nature endowed him to do, fulfilling his constructive possibilities. He is falsely selfish if he refuses the hard way when it requires him to conquer his self-indulgent attributes. He is altruistic even if in self-mastery he goes against the wishes of family, friends and all who suffer because of his integrity. Years ago, I decided to go abroad in preparation for my vocation. My mother was 62. Eight of her friends wrote reminding me she was well along in years, and pleading with me not to leave until she died. She passed away at the age of 93. The writers of those letters condemned me as selfish because I left as I did. My mother suffered to have her wishes disregarded, but told me a few weeks before she died that one of the best things I had ever done for her was to leave her when and as I did. Had I not gone, it is obvious I would have begun my eye training in the fifties. I would have carried in my heart a grievance more hurtful to our relation than my absence. I could not have been the financial and spiritual support my profession made possible. 3. Never compromise yourself. John Constable had come to the end of everything. Two violent interviews had taken place that day, one with his employer, one with his wife. Both had ended disastrously. John at the moment was pacing a station platform about to board a train. He wasn't running away, nor leaving as an act of choice. There wasn't anything else to do. He had a chance to secure a new job in the Middle West. The father of a college chum was president of a corporation that might employ him. He wasn't sorry to go, after Ethel's words. In her eyes he was a failure. You are never willing to do what's expected of you, she had said. He couldn't, in this instance at least. To produce the formula Scodner and Snell had asked for was out of the question. He'd worked as their chemical engineer for twelve years. He'd done questionable things too, made stuff that couldn't last, and helped them amass a fortune. This last product they wanted him to concoct was sheer murder. You've always refused to play the game, Ethel's eyes had blazed as she said it, and in consequence we've never gotten on. Five men from minor positions in the company have been promoted over you in the last seven years. Business is business, and you know it. You've been just as stupid and selfish here at home. How do you expect us to get into the Bayfield Country Club if you won't go out with me to the dances and dinners and card parties as the other men do? It's a shame. You've ruined everything with your horrid indifference. So that's what it had come to. He tried to fit in. He'd gone, too, plenty of times. Bitterly, John recalled occasions when he'd done his best to be a success according to the Bayfield pattern. Two long years of work came and went before John Constable was in a position to send for his wife and children. Money had gone to them regularly, he'd been accepted and had prospered in the new company. He had, in fact, begun his contact with them by selling Thorne an invention of his own that Scodiner and Snell had thought too expensive to manufacture. The royalties from the new firm's use of his creation promised to make him wealthy. It wasn't his financial independence, however, that caused the change in the tone of John's letters to his wife. He was a transformed man. He told her, moreover, that their reunion, as far as he was concerned, must take place on a basis they had never before enjoyed. I've discovered the cause of failure, both in work and intimacy, he wrote. It comes from one of two mistakes. One either doesn't compromise enough, or else too much. Every man who wants to succeed must choose for himself which way he wishes to go. All my Life, up to two years ago, I lost out by being unwilling to go whole hog in the ways of getting what I wanted. I couldn't be ruthless in winning wealth. I compromised most of the time, in half-hearted ways. 
I never dared to be myself, or to stand up for my integrities. Now, I've taken this latter course. I'm through, utterly through, with compromise. This company is one of the few I've found where stark integrity is appreciated. They don't put any pressure on me except to use my wits. I'm first of all a scientific man in their eyes, here to develop the usefulness of their products. I've found a group of friends, too, who accept me for what I am. If you want to bring the children and join me on this basis, I want you to come. But not otherwise. That Ethel decided to go to her husband spoke for the remnant of flame we may have buried somewhere under the clutter of our social masquerade. That she fitted in and enjoyed the adventure gave more assurance of her latent womanhood. Sooner or later, we each must make the choice that came to John and Ethel. Nothing in the setting of civilization requires us to follow their example. Success of a sort and the solution of many of our problems is possible by the acceptance of compromise and the discarding of the honesties. For a while at least, one gets by with arrogance and chicanery, beating others by competitive shrewdness and outmaneuvering them in cunning. John might have made just as much money and won social recognition had he stayed with Scodner and Snell, inventing products to cheat the public. Ho! Oh, could have done it, if he had been that sort of man. The art of overcoming obstacles is not a matter of morals but of character and consistency. We conquer trouble when we discover what we are like and decide to follow a way of life that matches our natures. Frustration appears if we live and act on half measures. 4. Taught to fail. Some years ago I sat talking with a man we shall call Peter Coe. The line of the rock is stretched before Mount. The sky was brilliant with clouds. It's strange, Coe mused, that I was actually taught to become a failure. I suppose my story isn't extraordinary except that it came out all right. How were you taught to fail? I asked. By being made to doubt myself, and even to fear? Myself, came the answer. It began in my childhood. My parents adored an older brother. He was one of those curly heads, who wiggle everything until it goes their way. I was made to sacrifice for him on all occasions. It was Percy this and Percy that. I believed it. My duty to keep it up. I worked at home while he went to college. When girls came into my life, I was shy and uncertain. I fell in love, but mother didn't like Helen. She convinced me it was my duty to stay with her. Father wasn't well and soon died. After some years mother changed her mind and decided I ought to marry. She picked out the daughter of her oldest friend. I objected at first. Agnes was nice. Enough but I didn't love her. Mother talked and wept. Lieutenant would be such a good match, she said, and make her so happy. Besides, Agnes mother owned part of father's business that I then managed, and we'd keep more money in the family. I yielded in the end, as I always had. It seemed selfish not to. But your wife loved you, didn't she? I queried. Loved me. She had no chance. She was as much under her mother as I was under mine. And, heavens, how I hated her. Your wife? No, my mother-in-law. She used to tell Agnes every day how much she'd suffered to bring her into the world. That was a lie, and she knew it. Most children come as the result of amative life, not from a horrible nobility. And anyway, the poor child had no say about it. There's something ghastly about good women like my mother-in-law. You know the kind I mean. They practice such self-denial they can't do anything efficiently. Mrs. Bassey talked and talked about self-sacrifice.
But. She was selfish to the bone. She had to be, she'd become. So dependent. She destroyed the life of her oldest. Children, stultified them with her possessiveness and ill. One died of pneumonia and the other barely earned. His salt, one of those echoes of a man. She demanded. However, that Agnes sacrifice for her, and Agnes way was. To make me do it. The women kept house for me. The three fates, I murmured. No, sir. That's what they thought they were and intended to be, but life fooled them. You see, there's something resilient and resistant in human nature, and destiny is often kind to us when we think she's being terrible. Anyway, there I was with a wife I admired but didn't love, a home I revered but didn't like, too. Mothers I respected and secretly hated. I had inherited my job and was totally unfit for it all of it happened. In the name of duty. Heavens, what an evil word. Duty. Most duties are desecrations of all that is beautiful. I nodded. They aren't duties, only ignorant superstitions. They destroy just the same, as long as we believe in them. But fate was kind to me. The business failed. Under my mismanagement. That left us almost penniless. I became ill with tuberculosis and nearly died. A distant relative offered me a cottage on his Colorado. Much, and the I went, alone. It took me five years to. Got well. My wife and our mothers had to go to work. That was their salvation, being out in the world, meeting people, two of them fell in love. Which two? I asked. My wife and my mother. He chuckled. Yes, sir. My wife and my mother. It happened to Agnes first. After I'd been away three years and wasn't progressing. Very rapidly. She wrote she wanted a divorce. Then I. Began to get well. The next year mother wrote she too. Had found her man. It's surprising how rapidly I improved from then on. There wasn't any reason for me. To go back after that, so I decided to keep a continent. Between us. The point of my story is this. If nature hadn't. Stepped in and made the business fail because I wasn't. Fitted for it, and then made me sick, I'd have felt it my. Duty to stick it out in a situation that was wrong. From start to finish. Not a single good thing came from. That attitude. It made misery. Our spoiling of my. Brother ruined him. He got in with a sporty crowd. Began to drink and ended on drugs. He'd never had to. Restrain himself. And look at the suffering that came. To both our families because I married Agnes. No, sir. In the end it causes trouble if you do anything against. Yourself. What should you have done? I asked. First, disobeyed my parents every time they tried. To make me into my brother's slave. Second, refused. To go into father's business, which I hated. Third, gone. A way to get the type of education I needed. I'm a commercial designer now, and could have gone further. If I'd gotten into art school. Fourth, I oughtn't to have. Married Agnes no matter how mother fussed, and fifth. I should have married Helen, whom I'd loved all my boyhood. Won't you come out to the house to meet her? She's my wife now. I went to witness for once a happy marriage, joy at the end of a long, long journey. Five. Love and duty. She was pregnant. There was no doubt of it. A feeling of dread came over Jane. Something seemed to stand. There in the dark threatening her. She felt its fingers. Reaching to grasp her throat she could not breathe. A wave of nausea, then a chill. She must pull herself. Together. For an hour she sat motionless, thinking. Swivey, the. Cat, got up and stretched. Snowflakes pattered against the. Window. Someone shook the furnace. She was pregnant, pregnant, 
And what should she do? It wasn't that she didn't want a child. All three years of her marriage she and Tom had talked about it. But the problems were so great, and there was the question of her career. That, after all, was the real issue. Twelve years of preparation, twelve years of the hardest kind of work, and her mother would have her give it up, wish, just like that, as if it had been play. She wouldn't have said that about Tom's vacation, and Ho hadn't spent a third of the time in getting ready to do something worthwhile in life. Tom, oh, Tom must go on. Tom must be spared anything that would disrupt his success. Tom was a man. You are a strange, selfish woman, her mother had said, a strange, selfish woman to want to keep on with. You're singing now that you have a husband and are to have a child. Was she? Jane wondered. Some assurance in her whispered, no. Her mother's ideas seemed abhorrent. She saw a vision of herself applauding along like a patient uterus, with no more brains than that. It made her shiver. And what did it lead to? Painfully she counted over the women she knew who had been unselfish after her mother's pattern. There was Mrs. Furriton. She'd been a lot of fun. As a classmate at college, and a brilliant girl too. Now, you couldn't get an idea out of her. Diddy's, dishes. And oilies, that was all. Mabel Salter was somewhat better, but you felt as if it were a desperate veneer, a brave but helpless attempt to keep in the human race. And feel the throb of things. She could chatter about the political situation and tell of the scientific discoveries. With the best, but something had happened. She wasn't the Mabel of yore. Jane didn't argue to herself that every woman ought have a career, not that. But it shouldn't be torn away from her after years and years of getting ready for it. And then to have the glorious experience of being married, and having a child, made into a sod and duty. That was what hurt. It took all the joy out of getting to have cruel virtue piled on it. There was something so wonderful, so natural about it left untarnished. By the denial people preached. And wasn't it possible to have one's children and yet go on with one's career? Schumann Hark, Louise, Homer, lots of them had done it. She, Jane, got no further. The door opened. Tom burst in, energy and anger on his face. Hello, girl say but I'm glad to see you. have been delayed, talking with your father, and of all, he paused. Not wishing to hurt his wife by the epithets that seemed to fit her family. The old man tells me I should make you give up your career. He seems to hate the idea of it talks about your duty. Do you know, there's something awful about such an attitude. A wave of wild joy seized Jane. She leapt across the room into his arms. Oh, Tom, Tom, to hear you say that it isn't the music only, although I want to keep it, I've worked so hard. It's the way they have of being so cruel and posing as so good. I'm not being selfish. I'm not. Of course you're not, darling, he cried, patting her. Gently. We're not living in their century, and there isn't any such conflict between love and duty as they picture. It's only a superstitious bugaboo. Any woman has a right to go on with work and to keep her career, if it's only selling pins at the five and ten. She isn't any good, either, if she compromises. Jane looked up at him, and she needn't go out of the home, or do anything especially. It's an attitude I'm fighting for. It's the right to be myself and not own institution. I don't want to be just your wife, or a mother, or a housekeeper, or anything else but myself. It's not a career that matters, I could give that up. I can't give up being Jane.
And that's what they want. Me to do. I see it now. I see what's happened to the women who become submerged in, in duty. They compromise themselves, destroy their sex appeal, becoming half alive sort of creatures. I'll never do it, never. Tom held her close. I'm with you, darling. I've been thinking a bit too. I've an idea. Do you know the greatest cause of divorce in America? No, what? Unselfishness, unselfishness as advocated by people. Like your parents. Women disappear under it. The girl. The fellow married is gone. He only has something left. They call, a, a. A mother, Jane burst in, a housekeeper, an institution. That's it. The men leave an institution, and. I don't blame them.